audience, I can see the hall filling up. You know the reason? Because you can be a data scientist too. For that session, we've got DJ Patil, the guy who invented or the title data scientist as a job role. He's an entrepreneur in residence at Greylock Partners. Earlier, he was with LinkedIn. He is here. And please welcome uh, Jim Cascade, CEO of InfoChimps, who you saw earlier as well. He will be moderating the fireside chat. So with that, we need Jim and DJ. <laughs> Stage. Please welcome. Well, 15 minutes. This will be a hot one, and hopefully uh, we'll be able to stay longer afterwards and talk some more. Yeah. So, DJ, honor to be talking about uh, data science. Hot topic, hot position. Most uh, sexiest title in the 21st century. And with you being one of the top data scientists, I guess that puts you as a guy who rep represents people are in the highest demand. So I remember last time we spoke, uh, you defined a data scientist as one part business analyst, one part hacker, and a whole hell of a lot of curiosity. Um, how do you, do you still define data scientists as that? And you know, is that evolving or changing as you see it? Yeah, it, you know, I think one of the curious things about data science is, and the reason people actually gravitate to the term data scientist versus the, the sort of more generic terms of just data warehousing or, or IT is because it's a fairly ambiguous term. And, and you know, I, I personally consider Jim one of the, the preeminent data scientists in the world as well, and he's been doing this for years. Thank you. A, and uh, part of that is, has, is that, I mean, when we came up with the term, it was, it was to get HR off our backs. It wasn't to, to, to really come up with some <laughs> new area. It was to solve a very practical problem. They, they, they send a lot of emails pestering you. A and what happened, I think, next is everyone kind of realized that they could be part of the community. They could be inside there. And I think the part that distinguishes the tiers or the ability of people to do different things with data is that curiosity. The part that I would add now that I think has change sufficiently is we're also seeing that the, the top data scientists are really excellent storytellers. They understand really three, three important concepts around data. The first is what are you supposed to take away from this data? Like what, what do you want me to see? What, what am I, what's the message? Two is great, now that I've seen it, what action do you want me to take? What's, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to call somebody? Do you want me to get to, to, to run, run the thing? Do you want me to just sit still? What's, what's yeah, the action? How do I operationalize that? Operationalize that. And then third, the part that I think we, we still are very much lacking is how do you feel? Like, show me something. How am I supposed to feel? You tell me about something about data. How, what's my emotional response? Is the shading of the line red? Maybe there's no lines. Maybe there's no numbers. There's just words. They're communi you're communicating it the data is not something cold and lifeless, but with, with something that's living and changing that people should, be care, should care about. So that, that's, that's great. That that's gives a great insight to, to the, the main components. So, so tell me how those all play out in a typical day. DJ Patel, top data scientist at LinkedIn, let's rewind and say, you know, we're coming in for a cup of coffee and our day gets started. Describe it to me. Yeah, um, it, it's great because many people saw Jeff here. So it'd usually start with a call from Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> so like six in the morning and say, hey, I think something's wrong. And I say, nothing's wrong. And say, something's wrong. And we'd start going and trying to figure out is, is there really an impact or not? And, and one of the things about data right now is it's an extraordinarily messy, complex world. Uh, one of the things I think uh, uh, my dad, who, who many of you guys know, it, it told me is, it's really important that you're cutting edge, not bleeding edge. Hmm. Bleeding edge is, is a very brittle place to be. And, and that's a lesson that I've really taken to heart because it's what happens most of the time when we work with data is we're very much on the bleeding edge. So things are breaking, data is not clean, there's lots of problems. And so we were trying to constantly try to figure out, okay, how do we get this back 
off the bleeding edge into the cutting edge where it's repeatable. Can we make it repeatable? And then once it's repeatable, how do we get the human out of the loop sufficiently so they can free up time to move to the next cutting edge thing? So making, getting insights repeatable and then quickly operationalizing so you can take action against That's right. Insights. And that'd be one side of the team. Another side, which is, is there, that'd be what I'd call the decision sciences portion of the organization. The, the side of the, the, the product data scientists are really trying to understand how do we create something interesting with the data. And that might be a recommendation system, that might be uh, a new funnel or some type of product enhancement that's going to add value to the user. Some of you may have seen those, those nice uh, maps that LinkedIn creates of, of how your network graph is, is there. And that, that'd be an idea. And then there's a whole other part, which is security. Yeah. And that's a part where I think very few teams are built out of data science. But it's a very obvious thing. It's like signal and noise. You're trying to find bad guys doing things in your system. That's a signal to noise ratio issue. Yeah. And so very much of our time was actually f spent fighting bad guys or fraud or, or, or classic issues that you'd see around those, those sectors. Yeah. So I've got a really important data science question for you. <clears throat> if I want to create a creature that breathes water and flies. Do I put gills on a seagull, or do I put wings on a salmon? Sounds like a good data science question, doesn't it? <laughs> so, uh, so actually, to, to the analogy is, yeah. do I put the business savviness into IT, or do I put the technical savviness into the business user? Yeah, I think the, the, the almost the, the interesting answer is you don't add the gills or anything to the, the creature. You, you, you almost start with a new creature. And what I think has been really remarkable and the reason data science has come, I mean, really, like, at the end of the day, so much of the world has already been doing data for decades. Right? I mean, we've been working on this for years before anybody even cared. And why, why is it new now? I think because we have a lot of companies that are doing very clever things with data to add value. Most of those organizations, I bet if you go and you said, hey, are you in IT? Most people, most of you might probably would take offense. Like that's, no, we're technologists. In the same way, data and the people whose data are not necessarily part of IT. They're part of the technology stack. They're part of the business. They're a hybrid. And the analogy I like to think of is in the old Star Trek, well, now it's the new Star Trek, too, because Spock is back. Uh, it, it's, you know, there's Spock is on the bridge. Spock is not in some deep part of the ship in some room that barely has lights and only has Cheetos. Right? He's, he's, in a, he's on the bridge. He has context. And he's earned that spot. Yeah. And that person who can translate difficult questions into hypotheses that can be tested or answered, that's the value of the data scientist. Most traditional organizations carry with them the burden of legacy, and they're struggling with this uh, of all the other demands that are very realistic. Security, bring your device to work, and all the other challenges that it's IT faces. It's a boat faces. anchor, though. Yeah, it's, a, it's an incredible anchor that just drags you under. So does that mean that central IT, corporate IT, who are, by the way, acknowledge underpaid, overworked, you know, don't, don't have the staff they need, does that mean that they can't become data scientists or contribute to the creation of the culture of data science? I think everybody can become a data scientist. The question is, what type of data scientist do you want to be? Uh, that's the point of the term. And that sort of seems like a little bit silly. But you know, I think there's one is we're making the technology easier and easier to use. Some key examples of proof points of that is one is the stuff that you guys are building at InfoChimps makes life really easy. Uh, and if you haven't seen it, you can see how, how easy it actually, I mean, it's one of the things I like. Uh, then we've got that point, proof point of today, Tableau had an IPO, and we saw yeah. a big pop there. Yeah. And it's like, well, why is a desktop app that really can't work any, on anything else other than a PC, but does really nice graphics doing so well? Because it helps people understand the pain and the problems that the business can't really get insights into. Right. And so as long as you're willing to play with data, I don't think you have to understand p-values and statistical significance and all those things. I think those things are helpful. But I think there's a lot of great stuff that just helps you be data-driven. And, and the way we really think about data science and organizations that are data-driven, what you do is you take, 
data is your weapon by how you create competitive advantage. How do you get smarter about your business? How do you get to a level where you're actually understanding the levers and knobs and creating value for your user out of data? So if I've got this legacy, these set of legacy systems and this group that's trying to get from underneath that, um, is it basically, I mean, where do I start building the teams that I need to create this new generation data scientist? Does it become shadow IT? Is it out on the edge, closer to the, where the business units are, the business users themselves? I mean, where does it start? Yeah, uh, the term we used to call ourselves at LinkedIn was the A-team, as in the, the old TV show and then a movie. And, uh, and the reason we used to say it is, if you can find us and hire us, we'll, we will solve your problem. So who was Mr. T? Uh, um, actually, it was a guy on <laughs> the team. I, I probably, well, I'll let him come forward if he wants to. But, um, uh, there, there, the, the reason is that the, what, the reason we thought of it that way was there's select problems that we only had bandwidth to do. And we wanted to select the most pressing, difficult problems for the business. That is literally, you get to a fork in the road, do you turn left or right or turn back? Yeah. Those are the kind of questions we were trying to answer. Pick the biggest impact questions for the business and right. start with one and keep moving. Absolutely. And, and, as you know, one of the big things in there is with those type of problems, you can't wait. Right. We don't have two years to stand up some very sophisticated IT typical data warehouse. I'm not saying we shouldn't do that. You mean you can't stop and then just invite IBM, Teradata, CA, Oracle, and all these guys in? Yeah, ex exactly. I mean, the, by the time we finish the POC, we're on to the next problem. Right. So what we're looking for is tools that have a lot of dynamic range. In, in the old photography sense, you know, you have a, a or maybe another better analogy is you, you buy an SUV because you can put stuff in it, drive off road, but also use it on a regular road. It's right. got a lot of versatility. It's a Swiss army knife. And you want a lot of these technologies to have that same appeal, that dynamic range. And the reason you do is because you need that versatility because we don't know what's coming next. There is a certain class of problems where the Teradata, Oracle, or classic infrastructure is going to prefer, perform extraordinarily well, but recognize there's no point in having that work for the entire stack. Right, right, so you're, you're, you're aligned, you get this new team that can be the A team and move around the organization. Maybe there's one of each A teams within each BU. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Spock, is, you know, in the, it, it, the enterprise, is one starship and it's got a Spock. There's another starship, it's yeah. got another science officer. Yeah. And so everyone needs a respective peer that helps, helps them do that. You know, people ask also, uh, even with Jeff, uh, uh, e even though we don't work together anymore, Jeff is one of, the, the, my opinion, is one of the most data-driven people out there. Does he have a math degree? Does he understand the Uber details of statistics? No. But I can tell you, he can go to town with the best of the data scientists and understand what's really going on when you get him to understand the problem, put some numbers uh, in front of him. So you know, I, I want to create this team. Can I do it without bringing new people in? Can I, can I take my existing staff and retrain them? One of the things that we found is the data scientists come from all sorts of non-traditional areas. And very often, there's people probably already existing in the company. They're just not given the flexibility to prove what they've got. Because we lock these systems up, and we say, no, sorry, you can't touch this data. And so we create a culture where it's you have to ask for permission rather than asking for forgiveness. Yeah. Once you shift that round, and you particularly democratize data where everyone can touch it, all of a sudden, Brilliance comes out of the strangest places. Yeah, and maybe the people you thought weren't data scientists all, be all of a sudden become data scientists. That's right. I think the, the best measure is to see what kind of great, cool things can be created for, by anybody playing with data. And we don't have to get onto this academic high horse that often we like to do around these, these type of technologies. We should try to be building the technologies to empower more and more people inside the organization to use them. Yeah, so you weren't finding yourselves with the, the toolbox of a naive Bayes algorithm with a logistical regression, linear regression, hierarchical clustering, and you'd come in with this and focus on statistics. It was really a, much more than that. It's about being clever. You can get away with a ton by being clever. And you don't have to think about these things in any sort of radical way. 
It's about how do you get the job done, how do you get it done quick, and how do you get ready to do the next problem? Yeah, I think time to market, enable your existing teams, give them access to data, um, acknowledge the fact that you have <clears throat> the issues with traditional legacy infrastructure, don't try to change that, augment it, yeah. and build an organization that's nimble. Find reasons to say yes, rather than having no. One of the, the most important things I tell large organizations is when you get put in front of the situation where everyone's saying no, 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 you can't do that, sorry, we don't have budget for that, stop the conversation and say, can we have a, 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 a how conversation? Let, let's just talk about how. Let's take the no, let's take the yes, we'll put that at the end, we're gonna have a how conversation. Yeah. And then we can decide if we wanna do it or not. That switches you to a, a system where you're asking for forgiveness afterwards. Awesome, words of wisdom. Thank you very much, DJ. Thank you, sir.